one with the possible abduction. The uh, owner of that premises is seeing two agents driving a green Camry, speeding up another agent as they've pulled that agent into the boot. All we've got at this stage is a green Camry, no direction of travel. This is a live ticking bomb. The fuse has been lit and it's up to us to stop that detonation occurring. They weren't going about normal business. They were waiting for something to happen. It was the first real break we'd had in the whole time that we'd been investigating the case. But you can't rely that everything's going to go like clockwork and that the bad guys are going to follow the script to the letter. It was a pretty cold crime. It was like a business transaction. He was known as the executioner. And he basically travels the world to kill people. Simon Says is a simple game with simple rules. You learn quickly to do what Simon says or you're out of the game. But when Simon is an international gangster and he says smuggle heroin, disobeying his instructions can have fatal consequences. We received a call to say that an attempted abduction had occurred at Regal Court in Glen Waverley and that um, the witness had seen an Asian um, male begging for his life and was down on his knees crying and obviously was in a distressed state. The second witness saw the two men then put the man into the boot of the car and then drove out of Regal Court. And fortunately for the police, the witness was able to record the registration number of the car and those details were passed on to the police. The case said all units in the Glen Waverley area, the vehicle we're looking for in relation to a possible abduction is Foxtrot Romeo November 929. Standby, I'll get the usual. As police at the scene waited for the usuals, being the ownership of the car, they took a closer look at where this young Asian male had been abducted. Glen Waverley, sir, I've come across a gentleman's coat in the driveway and probably or possibly the address from where the victims come from. I've also found a cat nearby, so I'd definitely say the old case has occurred in the driveway at this address. And we also noticed that there was a car in the driveway and the vehicle was unlocked. So we thought this was the victim's car. We door knocked the house and there was no one home and the house was locked and secured. So we checked the vehicle for registration to establish a name to the car to see whether it was connected to the house. November Romeo Kilo 353, it should be a 96 Toyota Lexan sedan silver. It was the right vehicle, but the registered owner, 22 year old Leon Tuan, lived elsewhere. 408, could you attend uh, that address, please? Make some inquiries. When police first went to the registered uh, owner's house of the Lexan, they met Tao, who was Lee's fiance. The two were expecting their first child and had bought this house. The house where the car was parked was being rented by them while renovations were underway. Tao told police that she and Lee had been awaiting an electrician to come there to give them a quote. When the electrician failed to show up, Lee drove the Lexan back to Regal Court where he had the phone number for the electrician. Tao said she was concerned that he hadn't come back, that she'd attempted to contact him and uh, was unsuccessful. 408, uh, any uh, suggestions from the uh, young lady as to why this may have occurred? Before I just stand by, she's actually made a phone call to her mother, who she says may have some knowledge of it. She hasn't been able to tell us why. I'll just get back to her in a second. Roger. All right, we've got the, uh, the girlfriend on the phone to the victim's mother, who says she may know something about the reason this boat's been taken. Uh, she refused to discuss the reasons on the phone. So arrangements were made for her to come down to the Glen Waverley Police Station. Meanwhile, police had discovered the car used in the abduction had been bought at a car yard only 10 days before. It had been sold to an 18-year-old by the name of Hoy. Hoy, 
When we went to the address, Mrs Vang, Hoy's mother, was home. Hoy was at school and he had the car in his possession at the school. We went to the school and spoke to Hoy and he had told us that the car had been stolen three days prior. Hoy had not reported the car being stolen to the police. He thought that he would report it after school on this particular day that we were there. As a result, both Hoy and his mother, Mrs Van, were asked to come to the police station to give statements about the missing car. In another room, police were interviewing the kidnapped victim's mother, Mrs Ha, and his fiancée. And when was the last time you saw your son? Mrs Ha was very calm throughout the situation, considering that her son was at risk. She was obviously trying to assist the police as much as she could in locating her son. Mrs Ha said that she believed she knew who was responsible for the kidnapping of her son, Lee. And it was a, an Asian businessman, a man by the name of Fook, that she'd met some months earlier. Fook was based in Hong Kong. Mrs Harrod was a clothing importer and he had approached her asking her to uh, use her business as a front or as a means of him importing heroin into the country. She told Fuchs she didn't want any part of it and she refused to assist him in any way. When Mrs Ha refused to go into partnership with Fook, he then made a demand for $400,000. The demand was made on the basis that he disclosed to her what his illegal activities were, thereby jeopardising any future importations into Australia. He demanded that uh, Mrs Ha then pay him that $400,000 by way of restitution. When she refused, over several months there was uh, threats being made by Fook that there would be harm fall upon Mrs Ha's family should she not pay the money. It was apparent that Fook's threat had come true. And when police entered the premises he rented, they discovered a clock was ticking. When they went back to the house, um, they found that the house had been ransacked. But while they were there, they also found a note she said it was in Lee's handwriting. It was written in Vietnamese. It uh, basically said that he'd gone with Fuchs people and to tell his mother that she had 72 hours to pay the money that Fook was asking for. We know that it's a live ticking bomb. The fuse has been lit and it's up to us to stop that detonation occurring and to find the person alive. Twenty-two-year-old Leon Tuan had been kidnapped, seemingly because his mother had refused to import heroin and then refused to pay $400,000 for the privilege of turning the offer down. She was currently in the police station making a call to Hong Kong to the person who had ordered her son's abduction, Truong Hong Fook. When she spoke to Fook, Fook again reinstated his demand for the money to be paid over and if the money wasn't paid he suggested that there would be harm to Lee. It wasn't play school, this was a genuine kidnapping uh, with real concerns for the well-being and, and the welfare of Lee. If his criminal record was any indication Fook meant business, when police here contacted Hong Kong authorities, they learned he'd been jailed for manslaughter and was a major player in the international drug trade. But it was a connection here in Australia that was of great interest in the investigation. When we spoke to Mrs Ha about Fook and how she first met him, she told police that Fook was actually introduced to her through Mrs Van. Fook was actually Mrs Van's brother. And Mrs Van is the, the mother of Hoy, the registered owner of the, the Camry that was used in the kidnapping. Mrs Van and her son were currently giving statements about the missing car that they told police had been stolen. We were able to identify that some three days prior to the kidnapping, the vehicle had been intercepted on the Hume Highway heading towards New South Wales. And it was intercepted by police again in Goulburn for another traffic infringement. The driver was spoken to by police and his details were obtained. The driver was identified as a person by the name of Long who gave an address in Victoria. We'd made inquiries at the address that he'd given. He wasn't anywhere to be found. So surveillance was placed on his premises and other areas that he was known to frequent. Police were also keeping an eye on Mrs Van's place, 
both had links to the car and in turn to the kidnapping. And Mrs Van was the sister of the man who had ordered Lee to be taken. Lee was somewhere and 24 hours had passed. Over the first 48 hours, there would have been something like six or seven phone calls between Mrs Haar and, and Fook. And on each occasion, the primary objective of the phone call was to attempt to have Fook acknowledge that he was involved in the kidnapping in some way and to have some sort of communication with Lee to confirm that he was alive. Fook adamantly refused to discuss anything to do with Lee and maintained that the only reason he was contacting Mrs Ha was that he was owed a debt of $400,000 and that he wanted that money repaid. Police desperately needed to find Lee before the deadline expired. They needed to identify the actual kidnappers and they needed to find Fook. Mrs Ha mentioned on the first night to police that about a month earlier she'd got a fax from Fook where it nominated four different bank accounts in Hong Kong and they were the bank accounts that he wanted her to put the $400,000 into. As police didn't know where Fook was currently staying, they hoped the details on the fax would provide that information. But it would take time. That evening there was a call made from Mrs Ha to Fook. We asked that Mrs Ha ask for a further extension on the 72-hour deadline. Fook agreed to a 24-hour extension until midday the following day. The time had allowed the Hong Kong authorities to establish the locations of the account holders. Each was put under surveillance, just as the ones in Australia had been. But the extension time had now come and gone, and Fook had made no contact. Then, two and a half hours later, he called. Fook indicated that the meeting would take place in the vicinity of Spencer Street railway station the next day. The surveillance people, the special operations group, they were all briefed. The area had to be looked at for the best possible positions for everyone to be put into place. On that next day, Mrs Ha awaited specific instructions. Mrs Ha she was obviously going through a pretty stressful time and the way she conducted herself, she was just uh, amazing. She was very strong and seemed fairly composed for what she was faced with. The investigators were then alerted by surveillance officers that four men had arrived near the drop-off point. They weren't going about normal business of anyone coming and going from the railway station. They seemed like they were waiting for something to happen. Just their mannerisms and their movements and their appearance, that uh, um, they were identified pretty quickly. At one stage, one was seen to be making a call on a mobile phone. Simultaneously, Mrs Ha had just received a phone call. This time the call wasn't from Fook. A different voice told her that she needed to go to a particular area at the Spencer Street station and to expect someone to collect the money. She was told to come alone. If the person that was giving directions to Mrs Ha in fact was one of the collectors at the railway station, then that person would have intimate knowledge as to the whereabouts of Lee. She was put into a taxi. The taxi was driven by a member of the police force for her safety, obviously and he was going to take her down to the railway station where the exchange was going to take place. After a harrowing five days and no phone contact with her kidnapped son, Mrs Ha was about to exchange $400,000 for his safe return. Fook told Mrs Ha that he was sending down a pawn, as he referred to, to collect the money and that within two hours of that occurring, she would get a further phone call that would give her the location of her son. That was the afternoon before. Now, residences both here and overseas were ready to be raided and searched and Special Operations Group members were ready for the handover. Once an exchange was made, the four that had been identified at the railway station, they'd be kept under surveillance in the hope that they would then take us back to a premises or uh, some sort of contact either with Fook or with Lee or with any of the kidnappers, any of the people involved in the whole situation. Yeah. 
But that hope was quickly dashed. One of the males did actually see some of the covert arrest crews in position. And pretty much immediately, he was seen to get onto a phone. And he could have been making contact with football or with any of the kidnappers. So the arrest crews were given the instruction to arrest the males straight away. And at that same time, all the uh, various uh, crews that were maintaining surveillance on the addresses in Victoria and also in Hong Kong were notified to execute search warrant. As this unfolded, Mrs Ha received a phone call. The caller was unhappy with Mrs Ha and they didn't think Mrs Ha was playing the game properly. She was further instructed to make a phone call uh, within an hour to receive further instructions. But when she called Fook's number, it continually went to voicemail. The main priority was Lee's whereabouts and whether the events of that day had any effect on his welfare. At this stage, the police had in custody the four men who were now being questioned. They basically gave an account of being asked to collect some money and they were going to receive an amount of cash, I think it was $5,000, just for collecting the money from a lady. But they weren't giving any other indication that they had any other connection with the kidnapping or any other knowledge of Fook or Lee's whereabouts. And, and as a result of that, um, they were released. The raids on the houses here in Australia weren't promising either. No evidence, no Lee. But in Hong Kong, where two men were arrested, there was a definite link to the kidnapping. In the execution of the search warrants in Hong Kong, we were able to locate the original fax that was forwarded to Mrs Ha with the demand, plus the fax machine itself. More importantly, there was a suggestion that Fook himself may have been there. There was an address book that contained Mrs Van's details from Clayton, the mother of uh, Hoy, the registered owner of the Camry that was used in the kidnapping. So there's a few items there that gave a direct link with Fook. Neither police nor the distraught family have heard from the kidnappers for more than 10 days. Detectives now hold grave fears for Tuan Lee's safety. They have uh, principals overseas that have organised and orchestrated the kidnapping. They've uh, obtained the services of local people here in Victoria to carry out the actual kidnapping. In an effort to confirm the safety of, of Lee and to attempt to secure his release, a media conference was conducted where Tao and Mrs Ha pleaded for the safe return of their son, Lee. The distraught girlfriend and the mother of the kidnapped man are too frightened to show their faces, but pleaded for 22-year-old Tuan Ann Lee's safe return. If you got my, my fiancé, can you please release him for me? Because I'm pregnant. I'm a young lady and I really need my husband's help. Fighting back tears, Mr Lee's mother spoke through an interpreter. Please release my son uh, to be back safely with uh, his family. His, my son is innocent. But the only outcome was the discovery of the car used in the abduction. It was found locked and neatly parked, only streets away from the scene of the crime. The first priority was to get the car out to our forensic science laboratory in the hope that it could shed any sort of evidence, whether it be fingerprints, DNA, samples of clothing, hair, anything at all from any part of the car. They didn't find anything in the car. One thing they found was traces of some type of powder that were cleaning compounds, so it was pretty apparent that the car had been pretty thoroughly cleaned before it had been left in Seaford. It was a bit disappointing to find the car in that state, but uh, you'd almost expect that that was going to be the case. Either the car was found in that state or it was found a shell somewhere. We arranged for Hoy to come back in to give us an indication as to what may have been different with the car or may have been missing from the car. And he, he told us that he believed that there was a, a P plate, a floor mat, and a street directory missing from the car. And then almost a month to the day after the car had been found, we got a phone call from a member from the Homicide Squad to say that Lee's body had been found in a drain in Noble Park. The male person was found wearing a clothing that was similar to that worn by Mr Lee when he was kidnapped. 
and it was apparent that he had tattoos that were consistent with those that uh, Mr Lee had. Police divers arrived at the Noble Park drain today, scouring a two kilometre stretch near where a man's body was discovered late yesterday. It was partly decomposed. Detectives believe it had been in the drain at least a few days. School children spotted it through an open grate. Search and rescue officers began an arduous line search, carefully combing surrounding grassland for any clue. At the post-mortem, it was established that the cause of death was a single gunshot wound to the head. There was an X-ray uh, of the skull which identified the 22 round inside the skull. Ballistics were able to establish that the firearm was discharged only a short distance from his head, uh, execution style. It was a pretty cold crime with no personal attachment. Almost look at it as it was like a, a business transaction. The case had now gone from one of trying to find Lee alive to trying to find his murderers. And one piece of forensic evidence that was not relevant at the time of his kidnapping would now become a vital clue in tracking them down. Police have confirmed that a body found in a drain in Noble Park was that of a man kidnapped from outside his Glen Waverley home six weeks ago. Divers searched through more than a kilometre of drain over the weekend following the discovery of Mr Lee's body. Homicide detectives say the post-mortem results show the body was dumped down this grate into the underground drainage system somewhere between two and six weeks ago. It certainly was consistent with the time that he'd been kidnapped. He may have only been alive for two or three days from the kidnapping to when he was put in the drain. 22-year-old Tuan An Lee was shot through the head in an execution-style killing. We have a kidnapping that has gone horribly wrong to the extent that after the kidnappers have not had their demands met, they have killed their victim. Once the homicide squad became involved, it was our role to look at all the evidence that was available uh, to see if any person could be incriminated with the kidnapping and the murder. I went back to the photos of the initial crime scene. I identified a Marlboro baseball cap which was located on the footpath of Mr Lee's address. We knew that the cap didn't belong to Lee and through a process of elimination we were able to determine that it wasn't owned by any of the residents of the court. So we had a strong inference that it had been dropped by the kidnappers. The witnesses that observed the kidnapping had seen Lee struggling with the kidnappers before he was bundled into the boot. There were two men beating another man in the stomach and then a car with the boot open reversed back into the court and the man that was being hit started crying. He was calling out, help, help. It was quite probable that the cap had been knocked off in the struggle and left at the scene by the kidnappers. The fact that the cap was found was important to us because with any baseball cap or cap that's worn, there's obviously could be hair follicles located inside the cap or a sweat can be found on the brim of the cap. That DNA could be matched to the DNA of certain individuals who might be suspected of being involved in the crime. And as a result of examination of the Marlborough cap, three separate DNA profiles were identified on the band inside the cap. But those profiles didn't match any on the police database. And detectives hoped another avenue of inquiry would give them a lead. I made contact with the brand manager of Marlboro in Australia. He was able to inform me that the cap was an original Marlboro product and that it could only be obtained as a gift when you purchase two cartons of Marlboro cigarettes at uh, duty-free shops at American airports. Ninety thousand of these caps had been given away. And finding the person or persons who had worn one of them 12,000 kilometres away here in Melbourne was almost impossible. So detectives put that line of inquiry to one side and looked for further clues to the kidnappers closer to home. It was important to investigators to find the house where Lee had been held hostage because every contact leaves us traces and we were hopeful to get some traces of the kidnappers at the house. Police believed that it was likely that Lee was held somewhere near where his body had been initially dumped into the drainage system. Basically, at different stages along the, the drainage system, there is a steel grate 
and we were looking for a grate that had been removed or uh, replaced or, or broken and that's where Mr Lee could have been put into the drainage system but all of the drains seemed to be intact. So we then went to real estate agencies in the Springvale area to ascertain whether there was any premises who had been rented or leased for a short period of time which would be consistent with what the kidnappers would be looking for. And we were lucky enough to find in one real estate agency that Mrs Van had attended and rented a property approximately a month prior to the kidnapping. She only wanted the premises for a short period of time and broke the lease after a month, which was consistent with the times when uh, Mr Lee went missing and after he was, was killed. While the renting of the property didn't implicate Mrs Van in the kidnapping, the fact that she was the sister of Fook, their prime suspect, meant this information could not be ignored just as the activities at the house were not ignored by neighbours. Not only had neighbours observed men of Asian appearance bringing mattresses into the premises, they also observed a car similar in description to that used by the kidnappers coming and going from the premises. We uh, obtained a search warrant for the premises to look for evidence of the kidnapping. We were obviously hoping to find anything whatsoever to support the fact that Mr Lee had been held at the premises. Upon entering the house, the first thing we saw was the curtains had been drawn and were held together with clothing pegs, which in itself appeared to be suspicious. Searching the bathroom, there was a mass of dark coloured hair uh, in the shower. I was hopeful that it um, was the deceased hair. There was also some plastic cable ties which can be used as handcuffs. We were hoping that uh, there may be DNA or hair located on those cable ties which would prove that they'd been worn as handcuffs by Mr Lee. However, those tests proved uh, inconclusive. So too were those done on the hair found in the shower. But in the shower was another item, a discarded cigarette butt. The DNA found extracted from that cigarette butt was consistent with one of the strains of DNA that was located on the cap that was found at Mr Lee's address. So that indicated that whoever had smoked the cigarette potentially may have worn that cap. And there was a street directory, similar to the one reported missing from the car used in the kidnapping. When we searched the street directory, the scene of the kidnapping had been circled by someone. Of all the streets in the street directory to be circled was Regal Court. This suggested to us that we're on the money. The detectives were gathering vital clues, but they still had no killer. But that was about to change. Further forensic evidence was about to bring them face to face with a man known as the Executioner. Police had gleaned evidence from the place Lee had been kidnapped from and the likely place he had been kept before being killed but they were no nearer to finding those who had shot him. But because Mrs Ha knew the mobile phone number that Fook had been using during his negotiations with her before and after the kidnapping, police began to track its movements. They were hopeful the records would lead them to those who undertook his dirty work. It was apparent that he'd been calling a number of motels and hotels in the Sydney area. Uh, the Lansdowne Motel um, came up a lot. Uh, there was a significant number of calls to that motel on the 3rd of May, which was only a couple of days after the, the kidnapping. So we went through every guest registration card on the 3rd of May. And there were two people who were of particular interest to us. One identified himself on the guest registration card as Michael Nguyen and provided an American address. The other was Bui Tuan, who provided an address in Los Angeles and a telephone number on his guest registration card. The timing and arrival of these guests seemed more than a coincidence when police looked at the evidence that had been found in the Hong Kong raids. One of the exhibits found in Hong Kong was a, a novel titled Until Proven Guilty. When we searched through the pages of the book, we found the telephone number of the Lansdowne Motel and not only the telephone number, but the number 128 was written next to that number, which in fact was the room number that Billy Twain was staying in at the Lansdowne Motel. Adjacent to that page was the home telephone number in America for Billy Twain. <laughs> 
Well, what it gave police was fantastic evidence to support our claims that Fook not only knew Bui Tuan, but knew that he was staying in that motel and that particular room at the time directly after the kidnapping. And the fact that the people staying were Vietnamese people who uh, claimed to be from America was um, very significant to us because the cap found at the crime scene could only be obtained from duty-free outlets in America and these two people claimed to be from America. When checks were done on the two, Michael Nguyen and his details were false. Bui Tuan, on the other hand, was who he claimed. Upon identifying that Bui Tuan was a real person, we ascertained that he departed America on the 20th of April and he arrived in Australia six days before the kidnapping took place. We then asked the federal police member in the States to check all duty-free outlets at Los Angeles International Airport to ascertain whether any purchase of Marlboro cigarettes had been made by our target, Bui Tuan. When you buy any duty-free items uh, in America, you have to produce your passport at the time of the purchase. There was no purchases made by Bui Tuan of cigarettes or any other duty-free items. But on the flight manifest, it was interesting because a purchaser with a Vietnamese name had purchased some cigarettes and a cap. That person was sitting next to Bui Tuan. It seemed more likely to us that the purchaser of the cigarettes and the cap had given Tuan the cap. Interesting to us was the purchaser of the cigarettes of the Vietnamese man was also the same man that had been caught up in the raids in Hong Kong by the Royal Hong Kong Police. A very, very strong link now to us. Oh, it was one of the turning points in the investigation. It was uh, the first real break we'd had um, in the whole time that we'd uh, been investigating the case. It really turned the corner for us that we could physically identify one of the kidnappers. At that stage, we knew Fook was involved, but we had no idea who physically was responsible for his kidnapping. And now we had fairly um, clear evidence that Bui Tuan was more than likely one of the kidnappers involved. To test that theory, Bui Tuan was found in Los Angeles and brought into a sheriff's office over other matters. And a DNA sample was covertly taken. And we were able to use that sample against the sample that we uh, took out of the band of the hat. As a result, we were able to determine that Bui Tuan's DNA was on the band of the cap. The news was encouraging, but extradition proceedings would be kept on hold. Police still didn't know where Fook was, and they needed to discover the true identity of Bui Tuan's travelling companion. We ascertained that Fook had rung the Marco Polo motor in, which is also in Sydney. And it was from there that we identified that uh, Michael Nguyen had stayed there four days before the kidnapping. And when he booked into the motel and completed the guest registration card, he wrote down his name, Michael Nguyen, an address from Melbourne, and also that he was with uh, a vehicle, FRN 929, which was the registration number of the car used in the kidnapping. That car and its driver long had been pulled over for speeding earlier on that same day as it travelled from Melbourne to Sydney. It was fantastic for us because we had not only um, Long associated with that vehicle, we now had Michael Nguyen positively with that vehicle that was used in the kidnapping four days later. The whereabouts of Long was unknown and police still didn't know the true identity of Michael Nguyen to even begin looking for him. But when a check of that name was made with the Immigration Department, they had luck. A Michael Nguyen had been arrested on leaving Australia. He had um, in excess of uh, $10,000 Australian currency and a small vial containing heroin in his possession. He was interviewed, photographed, fingerprinted and processed. Uh, he received a fine for $500 and was put on the next plane to Vietnam. We sent the fingerprints and photograph to America for identification by the law enforcement agencies in that country and it was then established that Michael Nguyen was a false name and Michael Nguyen was in fact Bui Tai Hu, the elder brother of Bui Tuan. And his criminal pedigree was extensive, culminating in murder. Bui Hu was known as the executioner. He was a hitman who basically travels the world to kill people. And as the police were about to discover 
He had no qualms in doing it. So you're now here at Mary's campus, that's good. Oh, they don't come by early. Detectives investigating the kidnap and murder of Lian Tuan had identified two suspects who were connected to evidence found at the place he was abducted. We knew that Bui Hu was connected to the car that was used in the kidnapping. His brother, Bui Tuan, was connected to the cap that was found at the kidnapping scene. And both of them had been contacted by Fook while they were in Sydney at the motel. Now, Fook's phone records would place them in Melbourne. He had called one mobile number 15 times during the day of the kidnapping and in the three days following. Upon tracking the phone's movement, we were able to ascertain that it was making calls from the location of the kidnapping, from the location where the deceased was held prisoner, and also it was making calls from the motel, or the area of the motel, where the Bowie brothers were staying after the kidnapping. It was apparent to us that it could only have been the Bowie brothers that were using that phone. So from starting with just a few pieces of the jigsaw, we now had um, a substantial part of the puzzle solved. Uh, in our opinion, it was clear that uh, Fook was calling the shots from Hong Kong, Bowie Tai Hu was the executioner of that group, and that he'd asked his brother, Bowie Tuan, to assist him. And uh, that Long was the driver of the kidnapped vehicle, and that he was chauffeuring the two Americans around Australia. On the day of the kidnapping, police believe that Long dropped off his American companions at Lee's rental place sometime before midday. The two Americans have secreted themselves inside the premises, while Long has then driven to a neighbouring suburb and waited for uh, further instructions. According to phone records, at 12.01, the buoys called Long's mobile. Police believed this was to alert him that Lee had just arrived home. They have then forced him to write the ransom note. Shortly after that, the Bowie brothers have then contacted Long and instructed him to return to the address. A struggle has then taken place. The cap has come off and they've then forced him into the boot. We presume that uh, they drove straight to the kidnapping house and uh, there he was held against his will. We believe that four days after Mr Lee was kidnapped, they shot him in the head. On that fourth day, phone records put the Bowie brothers at Melbourne Airport. It was 2.25pm and they were about to fly to Sydney. Only 15 minutes later, Fook called Lee's mother. Even though Lee was dead, he was still demanding his money. So we weren't dealing with um, nice people here. We were dealing with uh, very hardened, calculated criminals who um, uh, all they're worried about is um, lining their own pockets. The next day, the handover was scheduled. Fook escaped the raids in Hong Kong, and in the days following, both the Bowie brothers and Long left Australia. At this stage, we had sufficient evidence to charge the main players uh, with kidnapping and murder. Then we had even a bigger task of finding where they were. And uh, even though the world's shrinking every day, um, it's very easy to hide with false passports. It had taken the team over a year to get to this point, and it would be another year before their suspects began to emerge. Bui Hu, the executioner, was found in Vietnam. He himself was facing the firing squad over his involvement in a large-scale drug importation and exportation racket. I flew to Vietnam, and I interviewed him for a full day whilst he was on death row. You know, you know, if there had been murder, you know, who do you think is responsible for this man's kidnapping and murder? You all there, over there, meaning, over there, and all these people working on behalf of 
เร็วเข้มมาเร็วเข้มมาปอดปอดสูงเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเลือดเส้นเล